Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Securely Open the Digital Front Door for Your Customers. This event is presented in partnership with our friends at Ping Identity. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we get started, there's just a few things that you should know about the event. My name is David Davis of Actual Tech Media, and I'm glad to be your host on the event today. We're joined by our experts at Ping Identity, who I'll introduce you to here in just a moment. But first, I want to point out that we encourage your questions there in the questions pane of your audience console. We welcome all your greetings, but we also want your technical questions. We want to hear about your identity challenges, and we want to help to provide solutions. We even have a best question prize to help encourage those questions, and I'll talk about that more here in just a moment. But first, I want to encourage you to check out the handouts tab for additional resources on today's topic. And then also remind you that at the end of the webinar, I'll be announcing the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card door prize. If you're watching this on demand, of course, the drawing has already occurred. The prize terms and conditions can be found there in the handouts tab. And then as I mentioned, we also have a $50 Amazon gift card for our best question prize winner. We'll be evaluating and selecting that winner after the event and contacting you via email. So if you have a question on your mind, make sure that you get it in. Of course, winners must meet the Actual Tech Media Prize terms and conditions. And with that, I'm excited now to introduce you to today's expert presenters. Welcome Aubrey Turner, Executive Advisor and Speaker at Ping Identity. I always learn so much from Aubrey. And then joining at the end for Q&A will be Jordan Griffith, who is a Product Marketing Manager at Ping Identity as well. Aubrey and Jordan, it's great to have you on. Take it away, Aubrey. Uh, much appreciate the introduction. Uh, and again, <clears throat> uh, name is Aubrey Turner. I am an executive advisor at Ping Identity. Uh, I've got roughly 20 years of cyber and identity access management uh, experience uh, across a number of organizations, most recently, of course, of course, at Ping Identity. Uh, so first, I'll start by saying thank you all for uh, joining this session uh, and what is a becoming an even more uh, relevant topic for all of us, is particularly over the last 18 months and as we move forward. So as you can see, the title is Securely Open the Door, uh, Securely Open the Digital Front Door for Your Customers. And what my goal for you all today is and what I hope you come away with from this uh, session is a few things. <clears throat> First, leverage customer identity to enable your business to create secure experiences uh, that allow your customers to seamlessly interact with your brand. Uh, and then there's an element of this that is uh, threading the needle between adding enough friction to protect your customers while streamlining their experience and delivering a, a wonderful uh, sort of convenient experience. Uh, speaking of convenience, uh, the convenient but secure digital experiences powered by multi-factor authentication that your customers will actually want to use and uh, will embrace, and that are in some ways imperceptible and not re really visible as part of their experience with your brand. So well, I'll talk through that as well. And then one of my favorite uh, topics removing passwords to not only delight your customers, but also to protect them uh, and your business as, as well. Uh, as we all know, too many security controls to lead can lead to uh, you know, too much frustration. And certainly on the, on the flip side of that, not enough security controls can lead to the bad guys, so, so to speak, um, you know, opening the door to breaches and fraud uh, and uh, other bad other bad things. So either way, uh, we've got to focus on giving your customers uh, a good reason to choose you over your competition. And that'll be the final sort of takeaway. I hope that uh, you can uh, glean from this, this session. So, uh, you know, while, uh, while I'm presenting, think about your front door, the front door to your home. Uh, hopefully it's, uh, you know, it's an inviting front door but it's also got to be secure as well. And this is not unlike your digital presence. And so when you think about 
opening your front door, whether it's a familiar face or it's a stranger, um, these days, you know, when you're, uh, you know, for your front door, you probably have a notification and even some identification before someone even gets to your door. I'm talking about ring and other doorbells like that, that, that uh, alert you to uh, somebody arriving at your front door. Some of them even have uh, facial recognition. So the difference though, uh, between your physical front door, door to your home and your digital front doors, oftentimes you can choose to not let a stranger, well, you can choose to not open the door for a stranger. And even in some cases, slam the door in their face. Um, from a business perspective, we really don't have that option. So your digital consumer business front door, we've got to find other ways to allow you to securely open that front door. And again, that's, that's what we'll be discussing uh, today. So we at Ping did a survey, uh, I think roughly kind of in the middle of the year, uh, really focused around um, uh, you know, survey of around, I think, 3,000 plus customers globally. And I just want to share with you some of the, some of the results of that and, and kind of what the, the key takeaway um, from that survey around digital consumer expectations. So 56% of consumers like you and I have ditched an account or an online service when they became frustrated trying to log in. And this just happened to me in prep while I was preparing for this presentation a couple of nights ago where I was uh, logging into an account that I seldom use. And uh, to be candid, it was my HSA account. Uh, fortunately, I don't have to frequently use it, but uh, I needed to check the balance and do some other things. And I couldn't remember the right username and password combination. It was extremely frustrating uh, having to deal with this. And it took me way too long to finally figure it out. If I could ditch it, I would, but I can't. Uh, so that's, in some cases, we don't have the choice. So we tolerate uh, some of these things. And then 60% um, of consumers have abandoned an online service because of concerns about how their information is used. And this is the privacy angle in all of this. And I'm sure uh, you've all dealt with this and have some of the same concerns uh, that the respondents to our survey did. The bottom line, with all of this though is if we, and if you looked at, and I believe the survey is actually available on our website, the entire survey is available. The summary of all this, what it all boils down to is we know brand loyalty is earned at login. And you'll kind of see that theme uh, as I continue to, to kind of share with you what we've learned and how we can solve some of these challenges. Of course, with the past 18 months and more and more of us having to or choosing to shop online. Certainly the bad guys have taken notice, nothing really slips past them. So the, and again, this is a couple other uh, sources that we pulled this information from, but uh, the number of credentials available on the dark web in 2020 uh, for bad actors to leverage and for attacks and basically to log in as you, which is essentially in some cases what they're doing is 15 billion. I don't know the number of unique logins, but either way, it's a lot. And obviously with, with that number of credentials available, I'm sure some of them probably are yours and mine. <clears throat> What's also interesting is the value of the credentials worth anywhere from $5, five American dollars uh, to 500 US dollars based on the completeness of the data. So uh, what that means is that if you just have a username and password, but if you add to it, uh, personally identifiable information or electronic health records, the value of that data goes up. Uh, so that's, again, bad actors have taken notice and this is kind of the outcome of that. Uh, also, 26% of all web traffic in 2020 was associated with bad bots. And so this is a challenge as you try to open your digital front door, you've got to deal with all of this. And that's, that's a lot of uh, it's a lot of stolen credentials and that's a lot of, of bots uh, com comprising uh, traffic that, that may look normal. Um, bottom line here and one take takeaway that I'll share now and, and will come up later in the presentation is we have to devalue the password. And the good, good news is we've got some ways that we can do that. So this idea of uh, delighting and protecting our customers uh, as it relates to 
uh, opening our digital front door securely. Imagine, and the kind of picture I think says it all, it's a virtual seesaw um, and security and convenience are at odds in a little bit of conflict with each other. They know they should collaborate, but they can't seem to find common ground. Uh, you know, a lot like our political um, system these days in terms of, uh, you know, folks that are, should be working together, but can't reach across the aisle. And that's essentially kind of a dynamic that we could be facing here between security and convenience. So if we favor security more, then we're treating our customers like criminals, which is not good from a brand and, and experience perspective. Uh, so this, uh, again, could be the digital equivalent of slamming a door in your customer's face, not exactly the warmest welcome. The flip side of that, uh, convenience sort of pushes back. And if we keep the door wide open for bad actors vis-a-vis -vis something that's super convenient, this is almost like the, you know, like an angel and devil on your shoulder in conflict over who should be in charge or who's more valued, who's right, who's wrong. So between security and convenience and kind of on this virtual seesaw, kind of at odds with each other, it's as if they don't know what's missing. And so they struggle against each other. Not, not quite a immovable object meets an unstoppable force type of phys physics kind of analogy, but you get the idea. There is hope though, and so enter customer identity. Uh, so our goal um, is to deliver balanced, seamless, and secure experiences uh, for our users, so user experiences. And so we can create this harmony between security and convenience through customer identity. Um, the premise is if we know our customers, we can open that digital front door, offer a personalized user experience, uh, as well as securing them while we keep the bad guys out. And if the bad guys do happen to get in, which of course we know they will based on history and just kind of sort of all the breaches, uh, potentially we can put our customers in a, uh, I don't know, let's call it a virtual panic room of sorts until we weed the bad guys out. So the, the bottom line is we as consumers, we all make uh, choices based on, the, based on the desired experience. Uh, we fly a particular airline, we shop at certain retailers, we drive a certain uh, type of vehicle because of the user experience. But increasingly, security and privacy are factors in terms of selecting and choosing that experience. So if we can balance, reach this balance, and probably another way to look, look at this, if you remember high school chemistry um, between you know, an acid and alkaline and sort of water having a sort of a neutral pH of, of seven, if we can reach this balanced, secure experience, what I feel and what I believe is you know, we can, again, attain that harmony, uh, but we can also be disruptive and also uh, have a competitive brand differentiator. Uh, to whoever it is uh, you're competing with in your space. So more convenient and faster, but also more secure, again, built on customer identity. So from a, if you were to think about your customer journey with you and you were to align that with identity, what would that look like? It may look like something like what you're seeing now uh, from, from a streamlined experience and secure perspective. Again, your user journey, starting with registration, all the way through sort of how you're um, honoring privacy. So you register the customer, they are authenticated, meaning their, their identity is verified. Uh, they can do self-service, update uh, you know, information about them uh, if they need support, uh, as well as I talked about sort of having sort of personalized experiences and then, like I said, honoring their, their privacy. Identity is foundational across the customer journey, each step, uh, along the journey, we see these interaction points. And so we can use identity uh, to make this journey more streamlined as well as more secure. For the purposes of this session and this presentation, we're just gonna talk about the first two and re relative to these access experiences uh, being your digital front door. 
And you guys have all heard the, that, that saying, never get a second chance to make a first impression. Uh, and again, these, the, the, um, the, the impressions matter with your prospects and with your customers. So the reason why we're gonna focus on these, these two, um, again, this is where a customer may have their first interaction with you. Um, that's also a major form of frustration, as I talked about the authentication piece, uh, not remembering the, the set of credentials, you know, you need to, to access a you know, application. And then what we know is enhanced security in these areas can be customer experience enhancers. So meaning a more delightful experience with your brand. So these first impressions matter most, like I said, we're going to focus on the registration and authentication uh, pieces and aspects of uh, your digital front front door. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, oh, one last thing I wanted to mention on that. Let me back up one quick second because it's an important point. What I, I think what I believe and kind of what we've seen is that uh, customers will be repeat customers with you uh, if they trust you. So that loyalty, uh, if you can earn their trust uh, and loyalty, they will interact more with you. They will shop more with you. They will buy more from you. So uh, to kind of have that trust and loyalty, uh, these are the things that we need to uh, focus on as part of those priorities. Okay, I can move forward now. Okay, so knowing your customers right from the start. How do you do that? Uh, so this can be this this can be seamless, a part of their interaction with you, their access interaction. And because this is the first time you are likely uh, the users, you know, um, you're opening the front door for you for, for the user. Um, while again, you still need to have uh, you know maintain that you know that element of security. Uh, identity verification is one of the ways that you can enhance this experience while uh, being more secure. So you ensure your customers are who they are from the jump, uh, and you can accelerate the registration slash onboarding process. So there's a number of ways that you can do this, but certainly document-centric identity verification is one of the modern ways that you you can uh, build this integrated identity verification as part as part of the registration process. And what this does is gives you the confidence that you are engaging with the right customer uh, and uh, byproduct and really, really, really important is preventing fraud as well as breaches uh, because you're taking things away that again, a bad actor can use uh, to potentially uh, you know, pretend to be somebody, impersonate somebody, steal their account. Uh, so enhancing the security makes a better experience. Some of these web methods that we leverage here, we can autofill the registration. So uh, document centric, one of the highest levels of assurance, but uh, there's some other met methods such as leveraging um, cell phone records um, uh, and, and, and other forms of affirmation or affirming the identity that uh, may be attractive to you, but certainly integrating the identity verification piece so that you know who your customer is right from the start. And so this verification process checks a number of, of, of these boxes. Let's go back to that balancing the security and convenience and having harmony between the two. Uh, so certainly a outcome of uh, being able to do, to do this. I talked about the prevention of fraud based on, um, again, verifying that identity uh, against a verifiable source. And, and I should kind of clarify when we say document centric, that, that really relates to a state issued driver's license or ID or passport. So we have a high level of assurance that we've verified um, and correctly determined the identity against a verified source. And that's what document-centric identity means, uh, just, just to clarify that. So those, if we're doing that, then a uh, strong chance that we can limit, minimize fraud. And oh, by the way, if you're regulated, such as a, you know, you're in banking or financial services or another, uh, another arena that you need to know your customer, this allows you to simplify that process or accelerate that process of knowing your customer. One additional, uh, you know, one additional ways that we can leverage this, and, and this may be certainly a attractive to retailers, is that imagine if we can uh, offer discounts to verified groups. So it could be a first responder or teachers or whatever the, the group is you want to offer them a discount to 
make a purchase or whatever it is, uh, some kind of marketing that, that is attractive to them, uh, but you want the offer to only be used by eligible users, this verification method, uh, integrating this into the checkout process, for example, can allow only those eligible users to take advantage of that discount or whatever it is. So think outside the box and think about how this, this know your customer process uh, can be leveraged as part of your, your marketing and sales efforts as, as well. Uh, not just, you know, kind of, hey, I, you know, uh, I'm in banking and uh, uh, the regulators tell me I've got to know who I'm dealing with. So just, just an idea there or thoughts of how you might be able to leverage the integrated identity ver verification piece. Um, so also along with that is, um, you know, making logging, logging in secure and uh, convenient uh, for your customers. So the authentication process. So we're going to get into that. Um, a lot more now in terms of what um, authentication and how we make that experience better. But first, let's talk about the big problem, the elephant in the room, which are passwords. I've already talked about some of my frustrations, recent frustrations with passwords, and I'm sure I am not alone with the um, all of you that are on this, this presentation. Uh, I even hear some, some ads, uh, you know, occasionally that are, you know, register and, you know, enter your password. And right off the bat, I'm kind of already frustrated. Like, why do I have to create another password to register for a service or some type of um, whatever it is that uh, I want to use? And so, you know, I'm already kind of um, frustrated. So um, passwords are everywhere. Uh, they're easily forgotten. We hopefully, hopefully we're not reusing them, but I'd be impractical. Uh, to say that we're not. So we're re reusing passwords across accounts. As I mentioned, 15 billion of them are available on the dark web. And to make our lives a little easier, we choose weak passwords. And in some cases, folks, it doesn't matter whether it's a weak password or strong password. If the centralized database where those passwords are held is compromised and they have somehow found a way to get at the password, it doesn't matter whether it's a strong or weak password. It, it's irrelevant at that point. Um, so as customers, we don't like them. Uh, and by the way, they aren't even the most uh, secure way to keep our customers and our brand secure. They're just the most familiar and convenient. They're cheap and easy to deploy. And, and again, it's like we're in a toxic relationship um, and we have a hard time breaking up with, with passwords. Uh, so why do, we, why do we keep using them? Um, typically, I don't answer a question with a question, but what's the definition of insanity? And Again, the, the, we'll, I'll, I'll kind of talk about now why we continue to use, use them, even given all of these uh, bad outcomes relative to, to, to passwords. So the, the roadblocks, as, as I see it, why we have trouble quitting passwords, legacy apps and technical debt. And what I mean by this is, you know, passwordless kill the password has been around for, uh, you know, almost a decade. Uh, but the the hype of kill the password technology has only recently caught up with the hype and that's and that's fair uh, but and we've had compatibility issues as as well meaning we have systems and, and other authentication flows that aren't immediately compatible with password lists so these legacy apps and technical debt are a legitimate roadblock the other big one is fear of change so that is a that's a human condition. Sometimes we are, are apprehensive about change. We are uncomfortable with change. So how do you, how do you deliver something to users that they will adopt and be comfortable with uh, and not you know, try to find clever work, workarounds? So that's the second roadblock to password list. The next is we've got some cases, various user scenarios. This could be various demographic groups that have uh, different varying levels of comfort with technology. So from a consumer perspective, uh, or they're just different types of uh, authentication flows and, and different user scenarios that we need to factor in and, and, and consider. So, you know, those are, the, those are the obstacles that if I was to boil up all the, the reasons for lack of adoption, from all the customers that I've talked to, if I was summarizing that, it would boil down to sort of essentially these three things. 
Um, so the there's apprehension on both sides. There's ap apprehension from organizations in terms of the technology and then whether customers will accept the change. And there's even some misalignment between regulatory bodies and password lists and whether it's secure or not. Uh, some folks, I literally had a, had a customer raise a concern to me about, uh, they were planning to introduce more password lists, authentication flows and their regulators express concern because they thought this was a less secure way of authenticating, which kind of blew my mind for a second, but again, uh, just kind of the fear of change and all these various user scenarios. So despite all of these legitimate and practical reasons uh, why there is slow adoption for password lists or it's not as fast as we would all like it to be, uh, again, there are legitimate reasons, but I feel we can and should demand and expect better for all of the bad things that happen relative to passwords. Some good news, it's not all doom and gloom. And this is from that same survey that I shared some other statistics with at the top of the call, uh, or the top of our, our um, uh, presentation today. So 46% of consumers prefer sites that offer password alternatives. Count me among them. Hopefully I can count all of you among them as well. And then 53% of consumers feel better when using MFA to sign into sites. So we're seeing sort of positive uh, trends in terms of expectations from customers. And I guess I would summarize all of this in terms of what your plans are and what you're doing and how you're intending to um, securely open that digital front door for your customers. Fortune favors the bold. So I think those that uh, embrace passwordless will be able to, to win and compete from a, a differentiated uh, user experience. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that on as far as the, the passwordless piece is concerned and kind of um, dismount off my high horse relative to, relative to that. Uh, I think you all know how I feel about it. Um, so what are we really driving at though uh, is, what we're really driving at is frictionless. That's the desired end state. So as we kind of reduce the number of authentications, we have a risk model and, and more to come on, on risk and how that plays a, a role in these customer experiences. Uh, we kind of do fewer and fewer passwords, eliminate, um, reduce the number of centralized passwords repositories that we have. We can then move into these frictionless experiences and I have an example of kind of what something like that may look like that we've kind of all sort of experienced. Um, but before I get there, so what's frictionless? Uh, again, fast, it's intelligent, it's convenient. And so uh, what the kind of the, the analogy that I was gonna share with you. And so let's talk a little bit about travel and airport security uh, as an example of frictionless. But, just hear me out, bear with me, um, and, and hopefully this will sort of be relevant and, and be relatable uh, for us all. Uh, so your airport user experience may vary based on your, your choices. And in fact, right after this call, that's exactly where I'm headed. Uh, I've got some travel this week, uh, but hopefully I have everything together. So my, my trip through the airport uh, will be as frictionless as possible. So, um, I'm a frequent traveler for work, for personal, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to make my air airport user experience as fast and as convenient as possible. I've subscribed to basically every, every service, Global Entry, TSA PreCheck, uh, and uh, Clear, because I wanna minimize the friction that you encounter in the airport. And that can come in sort of, you know, having to take stuff out of your bag and sort of the long lines and et cetera, et cetera, right? You get, you get the idea. So as part of, as part of uh, applying and, and, and you know, participating in, in those services, my identity has been confirmed against verifiable sources, meaning my passport and some other things. If any of you have kind of been through this process, you kind of understand what, what I'm talking about. And so I use biometrics as validation, um, you know, um, as needed uh, to uh, confirm my identity as I, you know, kind of go through airport security. This is like, hey, we've seen you before kind of thing, right? So I've done these things on the front end and this, think of that as the uh, identity ver verification steps that I talked about. We've seen you before, 
we can reduce the friction in your experience as you sort of go through the airport. Now, occasionally uh, you get, and this will happen, you get selected for additional verification screening. They say that's random. <clears throat> uh, I'm hoping it's a little bit more intelligent than that, um, but that's the idea, right? It's fast, it's convenient, and it's also intelligent, meaning uh, based on some criteria, some context, uh, they may select you for additional screening. Here's the other interesting fact, people such as myself are even willing to pay for this speed and convenience, uh, again, uh, to, to, to have this be as frictionless as possible. I'm not suggesting that, that that's what's necessary as you build these frictionless experiences for your customers. I think as a brand, you can differentiate yourself and I think people will uh, elect and, and sort of gravitate to those brands where these experiences are certainly more frictionless. Um, by the way, I was opted in to TSA PreCheck way, way, way early on uh, when it first started and it's been indispensable. So what I understand about that is that it's been occasionally used as a marketing tactic to encourage subscribers. And I kind of see something similar with brands as well, uh, maybe offering a frictionless experiences to um, you know, a certain group of uh, your, your customers um, as a pilot and test it to see again, if it's, you know, makes sense to kind of offer that to the wider population and kind of using that as a marketing ang angle, much in the way that I talked about, again, verifying uh, an identity to be able to offer that group of users a better discount or something. So uh, again, these frictionless experiences can be used as a differentiator uh, as well as making things more secure. So no reason um, why we can't build frictionless customer experiences that securely open your front door. So hopefully that, that analogy you know, resonated because uh, again, I'm assuming most of us has kind of been through the airport if not recently at, at some point. Uh, continuing that though, talk a little bit more about establishing an intelligent risk engine. I feel like this is a, a critical part of establishing, uh, if you're leveraging customer identity to balance um, convenience and security, having an intelligent risk engine is gonna make that a little bit uh, more seamless. So this is a valuable part of building frictionless um, experiences. Uh, if I can characterize this for you, uh, think about your car and it's constantly monitoring, you know, tire pressures, tire temperatures, fluids, fuel, and a whole host of other vitals that you probably aren't even aware of. And this is kind of the same thing with an intelligent risk engine. It's continuously monitoring a, vari a variety of risk signals based on your needs, your risk profile, your risk tolerance. And so we can aggregate those signals to predict whether an authentication event is high risk. So some, some examples, device posture, um, user behavior, impossible travel, IP reputation, browser data, all these things are, are contextual. They're aggregated and uh, used to make a intelligent decision about authentication. And things are, I've talked, I've been talking about pre-authentication risk analysis for, for years now, and we're, we're seeing some of that capability from a fraud perspective. We can now tell whether you are a bot or a human before you even authenticate, whether you're coming to us via the web channel or a mobile app channel. We have a good idea a uh, high level of confidence. Uh, recall the 26% of traffic being bots. We can tell whether it's a bot or a human. So from a pre-authentication risk, risk perspective, this is like somebody walking up to your front door and you having an idea of who they are um, and what they want before they even get to your front door. Uh, so uh, in that same kind of analogy of your car having all these instruments and, and telemetry, um, it signals you when something is not right. And you have a good idea, hey, you know, uh, you know, maybe uh, a tire is running low and I've got a flat or et cetera, et cetera. You guys get the idea, assuming that uh, you've been behind the wheel of a car uh, at some point. So establishing this intelligent risk engine is, is key to making smarter authentication decisions. So a customer attempts to authenticate. And like I said, we're even pre-authentication, have an idea of, of what type of risk um, we need to be on the lookout for. We've got this intelligent risk engine that's looking at all these contexts and it's adaptive. Uh, we can deny, approve if it's risky. 
we can add friction when necessary. Uh, again, we have seen you before, or we haven't, or we've seen you before and something's changed. Again, going back to that sort of airport security, um, frictionless, uh, or maybe in, in terms of the airport reduced friction experience, but uh, in terms of your digital front door, making these experiences as frictionless uh, as, as possible. So monitoring customer behavior is better to understand the context on who is authenticating, signing into your digital properties. Uh, and like I said, we're even doing this now before the user even authenticates. Uh, like I said, see, like seeing somebody who is approaching your front door and kind of knowing if they're a friend or foe. Um, so, you know, you're maybe wondering how do I how do I do this? What are some options? And I'll talk a little bit about that. I uh, can't spend a tremendous of time on it because, again, given those all those various scenarios and all those var variables. Uh, probably a much longer conversation than we have time for. But if you're if you're aware that your customer base uh, is you know heavy smartphone, mobile device um, users, then you can take advantage of that because um, meet, meeting your customers where they're willing to engage with you, being able to offer them multiple methods that they will use from a multi-factor authentication perspective, mobile push, um, device native. So think of uh, touch, face ID. Uh, forgive me, uh, Google fans, I forget what that's called on an Android device, um, scanning a QR code. And this is gonna, this is actually really, really cool. So, cause I'm gonna talk about that here in, in a second. And then good old SMS and email one-time passwords. Yes, they're still out there. Yes, I know they're um, uh, in some cases vulnerabilities, uh, but uh, they are better than nothing. Again, in terms of balancing security and convenience. So take advantage of these, your consumer's mobile devices. Uh, here's a quick snapshot of, uh, again, some of those uh, methods that, uh, you know, you could consider using. The methods shouldn't add unnecessary uh, friction to the experience. Again, they should be based on, on risk, but you can choose uh, different methods and you can mix and match um, what you offer. So excuse me, some criteria might be age and level of di digital comfort, how savvy are your, are, is your, are your customers? And, you know, whether it's mobile push or uh, again, a, a biometric, uh, an authenticator app, SMS, email, uh, you can kind of see that we've looked at customer experience and the security level. So in some cases we've got maybe a poor experience, but high level of security. SMS, uh, you know, is, pretty good customer experience because uh, now some of those SMS apps will auto, the, they'll, they'll cut and paste the, the SMS for you. So the, once you request the SMS, it'll go into your text message. You don't even have to move over to your messenger app. It'll actually automatically paste it into the app that you're trying to get access to. So that's a really um, superior con convenience, um, you know, along with, uh, you know, some of the, the biometric options that are available. Even with the concerns about SMS spoofing and all those things, I think, you know, SMS, email, one-time password are better than nothing. And now let's talk a little bit about, that's kind of some things that we have available today. Let's talk a little bit about the future. So you've probably seen a, you know, QR code at, at a restaurant. Uh, and if you've, if you've, um, uh, you know, been at a, or maybe your own home or, or somebody else's home and you kind of want to log into your a streaming service like Apple or you know Fox or or whoever, um, one of the things that one of the options before you would have to enter your user ID and it's like this one one character at a time. Yeah, I got a com complex password. You're switching back and forth. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, just a poor experience and just painful. And one of the things that again, for example, with a Apple now, if you go to log in, it'll just pop up a QR code on the screen. And if you're logged into your app, uh, and if your device is trusted, all you do is scan that QR code with your device and abracadabra, boom, you're in, and you don't have to spend 20 minutes clicking and, and trying to type and use a remote to enter your user and password. So if you have a mobile app heavy user base uh, or have applications that even run on public or, or, or UI constrained, devices, this makes authentication much easier. Device will simply 
uh, display a, a QR code, as you've probably seen, that a user can scan with the mobile app. Uh, and if they're authenticated to the mobile app, they'll be authenticated to the device that displayed the QR code. Like I said, a streaming service like Apple, um, no, use, no username, by the way, and no password. As you, this is referred to as zero login, where there is no username and no password. In some cases, you may have a username uh, and you can still leverage a QR code. So this is, this is one of those ways that we're looking to make these experiences of you know, accessing your digital front door uh, even easier and being able to take advantage of some, something like this uh, can certainly um, uh, result in customers that are you know, delighted uh, and more happy with, with your brand, more likely to recommend your brand, more likely to choose your brand over a competitor that makes it harder for them to, uh, again, consume the service, make a purchase, et cetera, et cetera. So um, as I, as I you know, kind of wrap up and leave you with some final thoughts, this idea of securing the digital front door for your customers, uh, finding the harmony between convenience and security. And like I said, this presentation was focused on the registration and authentication where you really have that first real opportunity to make that first impression. So in a start by understanding, defining and defining, excuse me, your desired customer experience, what you want that to be like um, with, for your customers, delight me, protect me, respect me. Um, so balancing the security and convenience, like I said, integrating identity verification for all the number of reasons, starting with know your customer, um, building more frictionless experiences um, to being able to even offer sort of discounts or special programs to certain eligible members of your customer base. And then making the shift to passwordless, overcoming those obstacles because the experience is better and we will reduce, we will devalue the credentials that are on the dark web if we use more and more passwordless, meaning we're not even creating a password. So these are some, you know, kind of, you know, wrap up thoughts on securing that digital front door for your customers, building these frictionless experiences people want to have. Uh, and a couple sort of final thoughts, um, again, as, as we kind of close out, almost close out the session, there's a, there's a Q and A uh, that we'll be able to do here shortly. Uh, two things that you can, uh, you know, continue to uh, help us continue the conversation, uh, do some, some investigation or data gathering for yourself. So one is visit siam.pingidentity.com, start calculating the value of customer identity access management. And then two, uh, I encourage you to schedule a consultation with the Ping team, myself, somebody else from the Ping team about how you can innovate your digital experience. We've got a wealth of data and experience uh, helping customers with uh, how they should secure their digital front door. Uh, and I, I'd love to kind of continue the com conversation here, what your challenges are, share with you what others are doing, what's working, what's not, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Imagine the future, uh, imagine what your future use cases can look like. So um, encourage you to, to do both of those steps. Um, with that, I'll say a thank you now, but we're not quite done yet. So don't go anywhere. I'll turn it over to Jordan uh, to see if there's any Q and A that um, you know we'd like to we'd like to talk about. Sure. Okay. Let me check. So we do have a couple questions coming in, but feel free. I'm still monitoring the Q and A to feel free to drop them in the the yeah. Q and A box. Um, so uh, how how um, how this first question is how do you approach MFA adoption amongst users who are not necessarily tech savvy? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. And it I think it starts with sort of understanding your user demographics, uh, understanding who your customers are, being able to segment them. Uh, I've even talked to customers that have, and forgive me, I can't think of the their sort of names or titles, but essentially they are um, uh, customer care type folks who will poll uh, maybe run um, some types of, you know, user uh, user experience type sessions, get some customers together, uh, outreach, uh, understand, you know, what their challenges are, what their pain points are, their frustrations, um, you know, surveys, uh, and even look, looking at data that, you know, data will tell you a lot these days if you know where to look. Uh, so um, through those combination of things, understanding, you know, what, what your customers are, uh, and again, their level of comfort with, you know, digital technology, et cetera, et cetera. 
But I think certainly SMS is something that you know, folks are, are comfortable with. It works across a, a wide array of devices. And like I said, it is, it is better than not doing anything at all. Uh, and then on, on top of that, uh, I think QR code holds a lot of promise. Um, everybody, buddy, everybody from little kids um, to, you know, retirees, if you've been out to a restaurant in the last, you know, six to eight months, you know, you, you kind of know what a QR code is. So people have a level of familiarity and experience with these things. And I think those are kind of the best options initially out of the gate uh, for um, driving some adoption, especially among users that may not be comfortable or tech savvy or, or whatever you want to, whatever term you want to use to describe, describe them. Okay. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, so another one, uh, what's the best process to determine what authentication options should I give my customers? Yeah, I, I think some of those, um, you know, some of those same processes and steps that I mm -hmm. dis described, there could be a little bit of trial and error. And maybe you want to pilot with, you know, a certain group of users. I, I mentioned how TSA, you know, so I, I, it's not the right word. I was grandfathered into TSA, to, into TSA, excuse me, I was a frequent traveler, um, part of my relationship with the airline that I fly. They, I think, just enrolled a number of people that, you know, were frequent flyers. So kind of, uh, you know, that type of marketing um, of a solution and then collect feedback to monitor it, measure it, and see how it works. And then you can see if you need to tweak it and, and adjust it for a wider audience. Um, but I think that's, uh, you know, it takes some homework, it takes some analysis, again, understanding your customer base, uh, like I said, their level of comfort with technology and digitally savvy, all, all those, their level of, you know, digital comfort, if you will. Um, I think those are the steps that you need to take in order to figure out, you know, what, and, and actually, ultimately, even if you find that folks are comfortable with one method, still even offering additional options, I think, um, shows that you're, you know, listening to your customers and you're providing options. I think that's a solid way that you can kind of have the widest array of adoption and, uh, again, deliver some kind of frictionless, you know, experiences that your customers will, that will delight your customers and they'll, they'll keep coming back for and they'll, you know, advocate for you, talk about you kind of in that way. So those are the things that I, that I think about off the top of my head are good ways um, to uh, address that. Okay. Um, I, it, there, we don't have, it's not a question necessarily, but it is a comment in the chat, mm. um, from Sean around, um, having templated emails to create, um, communication, uh, to communicate this type of information to executive teams, um, particularly around security upgrades. And, and I, I just kind of want to make note, like, this is what Aubrey's team is all about doing of helping that kind of translation. So give a shout out to Aubrey of that's something that he can definitely, <laughs> <laughs> He's very Thanks, good at doing. So, um, <laughs> wanted to give that shout out. Um, yeah, I, and, I, I, it, it, and definitely is something that Ping Identity can can help facilitate that conversation too. Yep, uh, I I would also say uh, tap into you know your existing you know PR teams and 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 resources that often in terms of customer outreach and preparing your customers for these types of changes. I mean, once you've done some homework or piloted it or marketed certain customers, um, the communication and awareness piece is absolutely critical uh, with identity and this type, of this type of effort. We didn't really get into those, you know, finer points of what the program looks like and how you might actually roll something like this out. But certainly your PR communications team, your marketing team, would be among stakeholders as part of this type of project. Um, and it could be tied to, you know, some other type of customer experience initiative that again, could be sponsored by one or more stakeholders. Um, but yeah, your, your public relations and communications team that is, you know, messaging your customers on a routine basis, I think can help with some of the communication and then certainly internally as well. Oh, by the way, the, um, if you're still looking at the screen there, the, uh, SIAM business value calculator, some of the output and, and deliverables from that can also help with the messaging to executives around what's the business value of customer identity access management. And so uh, we're using your data 
uh, as part of the, the, the calculation, the math, um, but also some of um, you know, our experience. And, and as we work more and more with other customers around SIAM, we're able to sort of have richer and richer results from that because we continue to refine and update the quote unquote business value calculator. That the output of that can certainly be part of the information that you share upward or share with your stakeholders uh, to drive buy-in. And as Jordan pointed out, that's certainly something that I can help facilitate uh, yeah. <laughs> with, with a whole host of others on the ping team. Uh, I'm just your mouthpiece for today. So. <laughs> Uh, well, with, anything? Yeah. with yeah, that, ahead, I think Jordan, we're out of questions. So, okay. um, I don't, right. I don't see any more coming in. So I think that's, that's a wrap for today. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm off to the air, airport for what is hopefully a, um, a frictionless experience. Uh, <laughs> I want to, I want to, I want to thank everybody for your attendance, participation. And again, I do encourage you uh, to reach out, uh, again, leverage the ping art artifacts that uh, we've made available at your disposal, regardless of wherever you are in your SIAM journey. Uh, and again, uh, don't hesitate to reach out for the, to the ping team. Um, we can, you know, we'll be of help to the best of our ability. And uh, again, thank you. Be well. All right, great discussion. Thank you, Aubrey and Jordan. Uh, I really enjoyed that. We got a lot of great feedback from the audience as well. I've just brought up a poll question for everyone out there, our first of two poll questions before I announce our prize winner. And the question on the screen is, how has the shift to more digital experiences impacted the level of security you have introduced to your customers? Has it increased, decreased, or no change? Uh, so this is a single select question. I'll leave that up here for just a moment. And then I uh, will do one more poll and then I'll be announcing the winner of our Amazon $300 gift card. All right. Thank you to everyone who responded there to the poll. We do appreciate that feedback. Looks like it's been an overwhelming increase. Uh, 60 plus percent respond and say that uh, their level of security has increased. All right, thank you for that. One more poll question is now on the screen. And you know, the question here is simply, what's your next step? Your next step? Uh, would you like to meet with the ping team to learn more? Would you like to get a live demo? Would you like to receive an email with the ultimate guide to customer identity and access management? Uh, or maybe you're already a ping customer. And I see over uh, 12 questions. I'm afraid we didn't even have time to get to. I really appreciate those. So many excellent questions in here about, you know, licensing, uh, limiting the risk of compromised credentials in the enterprise, the typical time to implement the ping solution, how secure are QR codes, um, you know, comparing a uh, ping to the competition and uh, let's see resistance to you know, how do you deal with resistance to uh, moving away from passwords? Uh, lots of great questions. I, if you have a question, I encourage you to, you know, simply select the option on there to, you know, get a live demo. And that way you can get all these questions answered in your own personal live demo session. So I'll leave the poll up here for another few, few moments while we select our Amazon $300 gift card prize winner. All right, more questions still coming in. I appreciate that. Make sure you select, you know, to meet with Ping to learn more. If you have questions, that's the best way to get those answered. A personal, um, personal meeting with a Ping representative and a demo. All right. Looks like the winner of the Amazon $300 gift card today is Tony Dominguez from California. Congratulations, Tony Dominguez from California. We'll also be contacting our best question prize winner uh, to award our Amazon $50 best question prize. Thank you to everyone who joined us on today's webinar on securely opening the digital front door to your, for your customers, brought to you by Ping Identity. I hope the, that you enjoyed this event by Actual Tech Media and have a great day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.